This video introduces some very crucial and very fundamental terminology that's used in the field of sequence stratigraphy. As we consider coastal depositional environments over the next couple weeks, we're going to be integrating sequence stratigraphy right with the facies models as we come up with them to consider how changes in base level affect sediment deposition. The picture and the, and the diagram here are intended just to show that sequence stratigraphic concepts are scale independent. Although we'll be considering deposition at, at basin scales, the processes apply equally well to meter scale features in a roadside drainage ditch, which is what's shown here. First, a bit of review of some terms you've encountered before. You may remember that a depositional sequence is the complete base level cycle, from the top, through the falling limb, to the bottom, and then in through the rising part as well. This depositional sequence is what gives sequence stratigraphy its name, actually. So this video has two primary goals. First is to understand how the shoreline shifts at different points in this base level cycle, and to introduce some terms describing those shifts. And second, we're going to use those shoreline trends to subdivide the depositional sequence into packages called systems tracts. Finally, I'll very briefly introduce the names of surfaces that separate those systems tracks, or those subdivisions of the depositional sequence. We're going to use these terms really extensively when studying the coastal depositional environment, but you're going to learn more about the particular sequence stratigraphic surfaces as they come up later on. You first learned about sequence stratigraphy in the context of fluvial systems, where we introduce the concept of base level. So base level is approximated by sea level, and is important in marine sequence stratigraphy as well. So subsidence, like tectonics, used to sea, which is basically global sea level, and climate are all important in setting base level. You're also familiar with accommodation space, which is the fundamental control on sediment accumulation and the formation of depositional sequences. As you learned, fluvial accommodation is set by this graded profile, the space between the actual land surface and the equilibrium position of the river. In marine settings, accommodation space is the space between the seafloor and base level, which is essentially sea level. So therefore, accommodation space in both settings is also influenced by eustacy, by tectonic subsidence or uplift, as well as by climate, although climate is less important. So now for some new concepts and some new terms. Sequence stratigraphy at its core is centered on the pattern of shoreline shift. It was developed in these coastal depositional environments and it's really best applied in these settings. The shoreline trajectory is what we're going to use to divide the base level cycle into parts. And the shoreline trajectory also controls the vertical succession of facies. Remember that Walther's Law states that the vertical superposition of facies is related to the ones that were originally laterally adjacent to each other. So these terms here are really fundamental terms that we're going to be using over and over again. The shoreline can either retreat landward, you can think of this basically as sea level rise, so that the beach moves onto the land from where it used to be. This type of shift is called transgression. The opposite is called regression, and that's where the coastline builds seaward, or builds oceanward. Aggradation refers to the building up of the shoreline, whereas incision is it eroding downward. These terms are used the same way here as, as in the way that you previously encountered them in a fluvial system. So you've seen and you've used the base level curve before. So remember that base level can be affected by sea level, subsidence, or to a small extent by, by climate. For simplicity, we can think of this as a sea level curve, but remember that the, this base level curve here is not just sea level, and it doesn't have to be symmetrical and, and smooth like this either. What's actually important for, for sequence stratigraphy is the rate of base level change. So the position of the shoreline is just a balance between the rate of base level change and the rate of sedimentation, which for simplicity we're going to treat as a constant. So the green box indicates that the rate of sedimentation is a certain positive amount at all times in every setting here. So let's use this to divide this base level curve into sections. So there are times when base level is falling, 
Therefore, the rate of base level change, which is the rate that accommodation space is being created, is negative. So because base level is falling, depositional systems in size and the shoreline regresses or builds oceanward. There are also times when base level is rising more rapidly than sediment is being supplied. So because base level is rising, the shoreline and the facies aggrade, and because base level rise outpaces sedimentation, the shoreline will transgress or move landward. Finally, base level, rise can, base level can rise, but it can rise at a rate slower than sediment is accumulating. This occurs at the beginning and at the end of base level rise when the rate is slower. So because base level is still rising, sediments and the shoreline will aggrade. But the sediment will kind of overfill the available accommodation space and the shoreline will regress. So the, the little arrows indicate the trajectory of the shoreline and its components of regression, transgression, incision, and aggradation. So you might note that the shoreline transgresses when base level rise is rapid and regresses either when base level is falling or when the rate of base level rise is slower than sedimentation rate. So those two types of regression are given different names. Base level fall creates something called forced regression because it's forced by falling base level. And normal regression occurs when base level rise happens but is outpaced by sedimentation. So we have normal regression during base level rise, transgression during fast base level rise, and forced regression during base level fall. Regression and transgression refer to shifts in the physical location of the shoreline. So that shoreline trajectory leads to vertical stacking patterns of facies due to Walther's law. Transgression of the shoreline leads to a retrogradational stacking pattern. Retrogradation is when deeper water facies, or more distal facies, overlie more proximal, or more landward or shoreward facies, shallow water facies. Progradation, as you've already encountered, um, is the building of facies away from the source. So in a coastal setting, it results from regression of the shoreline and is marked by a vertical succession from more distal or more offshore facies at the base to more proximal or more shallow water or even terrestrial facies at the top. A couple words of caution. First, in, in this class, we're going to consider really only these very simple, idealized examples where a single curve of regression and transgression applies to all parts of the sedimentary basin. But note, in the real world, subsidence and sedimentation rates can definitely vary across a basin, either you know, from the shoreline out towards the offshore environment or even laterally along a coastline. So therefore, it's possible for transgression to occur in one part of the basin, while regression is simultaneously happening elsewhere. Also, it's important to note that this complete cycle of transgression, normal regression, forced regression, don't always have to occur. If subsidence is very rapid, forced regression may never occur, because even though sea level is dropping, the basin is subsiding fast enough that base level is always rising. If sedimentation is very rapid, it may prevent the shoreline from even transgressing. You know, a delta and many deltas today are still prograding, even though sea level is, is rising, even though base level is rising. So the complete depositional sequence is divided into component parts called systems tracts. A systems tract is an interval of relatively stable depositional systems uh, what that means is that you have sort of deltas and beaches and so forth that are all kind of doing the same thing. They're all prograding or they're all retrograding. Uh, these relatively stable parts are separated by recognizable surfaces that represent reorganizations of the sediment, a shift from a delta to an estuary, for example. Systems tracts are recognized in the sedimentary rock record by their facey stacking patterns, whether it's progradation or retrogradation, by their position within the depositional sequence, and by the nature and the characteristics of the upper and the lower bounding surfaces.
So here is again the base level curve, the rates of base level change divided into regression and transgression. There's also now a transgression regression curve, which you can see does not exactly follow the base level curve, it's somewhat more asymmetrical. So this time of, and so we're going to use this curve, I should mention, to divide this complete sequence into these systems tracks. We're going to use um, the normal and forced regression and the transgression, which creates these characteristic depositional patterns to divide us into systems tracks. So the time of forced regression during base level fall is called the falling stage systems tract, or FSST. Uh, it gets its name because base level is falling. The subsequent interval of normal regression is the low stand systems tract, or the LST. It occurs immediately following the lowest point on the base level curve during the initial part of base level rise, but still where the facies are prograding. Transgression defines quite logically the transgressive systems tract, or the TST. And finally, the last part of base level rise characterized by normal regression is called the high stand systems tract, or the HST. Conveniently, these, these system tracks have fairly logical names, so it's not too difficult to remember how they fit into the base level cycle. Finally, I just want to introduce the names of the seven sequence stratigraphic surfaces. These names won't mean anything now, and we're going to consider them individually as they become relevant in particular depositional settings, so don't worry about them too much at this point. The maximum flooding surface marks the end of transgression. Note that it's not the highest point on the base level curve. It is the highest point on the transgressive regressive curve. And the maximum regressive surface marks the end of normal regression. This is the maximum progradation of facies into the basin. The beginning and the end of forced regression, um, at least in offshore marine settings, can be bounded by surfaces called the basal surface of forced regression and the correlative conformity. These two surfaces are difficult or even impossible to identify in outcrop, so we're not really going to deal with them at all. Three surfaces are erosional, the subaerial unconformity and the regressive surface of marine erosion, which I've abbreviated here as RSME, just because I don't have any space to write the whole name. Um, they form during base level fall, during forced regression. And then there's the transgressive ravinement surface, which forms during transgression, a rapid base level rise. Some of these surfaces are better developed in some environments than in others, and they have somewhat different characteristics depending on the setting, so we're going to cover them all in more detail later on. So for now, just make sure that you're familiar with the terminology for shoreline shifts, progradation, retrogradation of facies, and the systems track names.